Bob is going to talk about something a little bit different. State of the Union and Roadmap for Mobile, Wearables, SBCs, and IoT running Ethereum. Hello? Let's see if this works this time. Hey, hey. OK. Fantastic. Slides. So, uh, hi. <laughs> I, uh, I'm Bob Sumwell. I've uh, Most of my career has actually been in the games industry um, uh, at EA Sports. Um, I have been working on uh, ARM Linux cross builds uh, of, of the C++ client for the last year or so. And then since February, I've been working for the foundation as well uh, on the C++ client and various other things. This is my desk in Vancouver. Got a, a Raspberry Pi here, S various other Pies, uh, an Odroid, a a project chip, and in the background there, I've got a Commodore 64 and an Atari. I'm not trying to get Ethereum to run on. It would be great if we could, but I think they're a little bit low spec. Uh, but I have been looking at mobile devices and wearables. So what are resource-constrained devices? Uh, there's lots of different kind of uh, constraints that you might have. Um, I mean, ultimately, all computing devices are constrained, but really it's talking about things which are less capable than desktop machines, and there's lots of different dimensions that um, that might be happening in. Uh, you know, you might be limited CPU. Uh, you know, most desktops now, 64-bit, uh, but 32 is going to be around for a long, long time. Um, Lots of them in these kind of uh, devices are, are just single core. They may be pretty low uh, frequency as well. Limited memory, limited storage, limited bandwidth, um, limited power as well. Um, and also the OS itself may be limited. Lots of such devices are basically you know, single app at a time. So some kind of uh, examples of these, uh, wearables, um, you know, be those smart rings or watches or uh, uh, health tracking devices. Um, mobile devices, though they are very prevalent now, they are very constrained compared to desktops, even tablets, same thing. Games consoles, people often don't think of those as being constrained, but they, they are. Um, and more generally, just embedded devices, lots of single board uh, computers like Raspberry Pi, um, and really, IoT devices of all stripes is really where this stuff gets interesting. So, I mean, why, why would you care about having Ethereum, you know, on your smartwatch um, or any such device? Well, really, when you look at mobile computing, I mean, mobile computing now is mainstream computing. Um, for lots of people in the world, uh, they're smart. Um, phone that they get is likely their first computer. Um, and really, if you look at the specs on mobile devices, they are of comparable uh, specifications to what desktops were not so very long ago. Um, you've got mobile, uh, and then after that, wearable, taking it down a, a bit. Edge computing is a term that you'll hear more and more in the coming years, um, really along uh, along the theme that if you have billions and billions of devices, they're not going to run client-server. There's no way that you can have some you know, mega farm that they're all talking to and waiting their instructions. Devices need to become autonomous to scale. <coughs> uh, and also, really, along Andreas' uh, analogy, um, boundary security is, is a dying paradigm. Really, you need individual nodes to be working on the assumption that they are in a, in a hostile place and they need to be responsible for their own security. This is not new. On my right hand here, I have a Java ring. Don't know if anyone is aware of the Java ring. 1998, uh, at the Java Developer Conference in 1998, this was a giveaway. Um, and what it is, is a 
uh, there is basically a chip in there running Java uh, with a battery in there, and the external part is actually a physical contact. And it was doing public key encryption in 1998. And this is how it was envisaged it would be used. Lots of things that we're talking about now. Smart locks. Uh, the, the, the blue dot, the way that that works is uh, you, would, you would physically touch your ring onto, onto the blue button. That would do signing using the private key that was in this device. Um, and really, I mean, barring the fact that you haven't got uh, NFC at that point, it's a lot of the, the sort of things that we're looking at now. Coming right up to the future, um, this is the Samsung Gear S3 uh, smartwatch, which has been announced but not released yet. On my other wrist, I have a, an S2, which is pretty similar spec to it. But if you look at this, you know, you've got a, you've got a dual core ARM chip, um, three quarters of a gig of, of memory, four gig of flash storage, um, not only Bluetooth and Wi Fi but also LTE and GPS. Um, accelerator gyro, heart rate monitor, and so on. Um, and, and I mean, the other thing that you have on this device is actually you've got a GPU with hardware accelerated 3D graphics on your watch. Um, so this kind of caliber of device is obviously, you know, it's, it's kind of top end for that. <coughs> but it's indicative of how even these constrained devices are, are really moving up in spec, but it's expensive. Project chip, $9. Um, and what you have there, again, you know, you've got a, a system on a chip, an ARM device, you've, you've got a Mali GPU, you know, nearly as good as spec, but it's $9. If you go down lower, you're not going to run Ethereum on this, um, but uh, Espressive Systems, who are Shanghai-based, um, this chip you can get it for about for about two dollars, and it's it's about the cheapest kind of Wi-Fi capable uh, uh, device you can get. Uh, you know, again, 32-bit RISC chip. I mean, very very low uh, specs. But this kind of price point and this kind of caliber of device is likely to sort of creep up in specs to some of those higher ones over the coming years. So, you know, that, that kind of price point is not inconceivable for running um, an Ethereum capable device in the near future. This is a quote that, you, you know, this is a figure that you see all the time is, you know, going to be 50 billion IoT devices by 2020. Looks like the consensus on that has come down to 30 billion, which is, you know, is less, but it's still a gigantic number of machines. So you may be thinking, you know, some of this stuff that you're saying here, Bob, I've, I think I've heard this before. Um, so this is Paul Brody, who uh, was previously at IBM, um, leading Project Adept, and and here is Henning, who I believe is here later in the week. And Project Adept was unveiled in January 20, uh, 2015 uh, using Telehash, um, BitTorrent, and Ethereum. Um, and there are follow-on projects which are still going here, which is really looking to, to blend um, blockchain and IoT. Um, and these efforts are still really ongoing, though the projects are changing. This is still what we're all aiming for. Um, and this is a slide from one of the, uh, the Project Adept ones, which is basically showing this, this really long-term progression through from the 50s, you know, really small number of, of mainframes, through personal computers, through mobile, and on and on and on. And we are going to have a gigantic number of devices um, in the near future. So who knows what the actual figures are going to be. 
So I mean, across that, you, you've got a sliding scale of options, really, um, for Ethereum. You know, the very easy thing to do on a very constrained device right now is basically not really to run anything on it, but have it talk to a trusted server. Uh, you know, just sign transactions and talk to a trusted server. I think that's kind of the integration route that you're going to see on a lot of uh, of mobile devices. But Light Client um, is a big, big step up to it. Uh, you know, from that, which is really, um, you know, it's 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 really then running as a standalone node that is, you know, not assuming trust, uh, and then up through full node and archival. Um, but as we've as we've heard, um, Ethereum Light Client really really close now. Um, for myself, um, you know, the question of of why C plus plus for resource constrained devices. You know, why why am I even bothering doing this? Why am I even looking at this rather than just uh, you know the, the Geth implementation? And and really, the reason is that if you if you look at the the gains that we're getting from Moore's law, they are slowing down. You know, there's only so small you can get, and we're, we're kind of getting towards the end of the line on that. Amdahl's law is something which a lot of people are not aware of, but it's going to become very, very important in the coming years. And what, what Amdahl's law is, is, is saying is that, you know, not everything that there is can be uh, parallelized, you know, to an infinite degree. Programs do have, uh, you know, critical path pieces which are, serial by nature and depending on the parallel proportion that you have available you, you are basically capped on how much speed you can get by uh, by adding more cores and and it's and it's a fact really that for the majority of general purpose programs that constant is probably really quite quite low you know you see on on PCs there's very few apps that can take advantage of, you know, 4, 8, 16 cores. You just end up with multiple apps running in, in parallel. Uh, so, I mean, what that means is is raw performance does ultimately matter. Um, you know, uh, you see now also uh, compiler settings optimizing for power usage, that where you're running from batteries, actually the, you know, the power drain, it, it does matter. Uh, also, modern C++ doesn't suck anymore. Most C++ is not modern C++. Um, but, but you can write C++ apps that look fairly similar to other ones. Uh, but most importantly is maximum portability. Is C and C++, you know, they are the language which uh, pretty much all OSs and systems programming is done in. Um, so really, when you're, when you're looking at these very constrained devices, having the raw power of, of C++ does actually matter. Um, so cross CPP Ethereum is, uh, is what I've been working on for the last uh, year and a bit. And it's Docker files and bash scripts to cross build uh, CPP Ethereum to, to ARM Linux. And uh, you know we had the first successful uh, cross built binaries in November of last year. It's been largely stalled since then, uh, and especially since February. When I joined the foundation, and then I've been just working for the foundation on foundation things, not on my own project here. Um, uh, but very soon, I will be starting on light client implementation for C++. Uh, I did receive a grant for that, for which I'm very grateful, and I hope to actually do some work on that soon. Um, so a number of devices have had uh, success with this already. Um, uh, Yola phone running Selfish OS, um, also Ubuntu phone, a, a, a goodly variety of, of single board computers, and um, I'm targeting further SBCs and Tizen and Android and iOS. Um, very low demand, really, for, for x86 for Intel. Uh, ARM is where it's at. Um, looking beyond my work, um, uh, Peter has had uh, Go Ethereum cross builds working for a goodly amount of time uh, there on on ARM uh, ARM64 and more recently on MIPS as well. Interestingly, uh, 
the light client work. So Zolt uh, will be presenting on his progress on light client as well. Um, and the stats here are from uh, John Garrett's uh, on what he is seeing of that LES branch running on a Raspberry Pi 3. So, so the binary, 25 meg, uh, the chain data only coming in at 50, 50 meg, only using 12% uh, of CPU and uh, the high, high watermark on the RAM of, of 162. So I mean, these figures are very much, very, very doable on uh, a lot of these devices. Um, nine, nine minutes there for a header sync. Um, the, the smallest device that I'm aware of that we've got um, Ethereum running on so far is a Raspberry Pi A, which is a very, very weedy device. And that was full client as well. That was prior to any of this uh, LES work. So it's, it's quite conceivable that we can, that we can have uh, Ethereum running on something even weedier than a Raspberry Pi A um, and getting down to some really, really very minimal devices. And Whisper. You know, so Whisper development has restarted quite recently. Um, that's also something which is going to be very applicable for these kind of devices. Um, and also Raiden. I haven't got it on slides here. I'd kind of forgotten. But Raiden is going to be very, very applicable to these kind of devices. So, you know, what are the ultimate constraints on, on running Ethereum on, uh, on limited hardware? Um, so yeah, I mean, the specs there on the Raspberry Pi Model A, you know, it's a, it's a single core, only 256 meg of memory, um, 700 megahertz. That device um, can run full client. Um, the problem is that the, you know, the full sync on that, it can barely keep pace. That no longer a problem, though, if you're running light client. Um, so I mean, you know, what are the ultimate constraints? Well, the CPU's got to be able to execute the, the EVM fast enough. You know, this kind of caliber of device can do that. Uh, you've got to have enough memory. Um, I, I'd imagine that's going to stay around the same, even with Light Client, even through Casper as well. And you need to have enough storage for blocks, though the storage um, bottleneck there really goes away quite a lot with, with Light Client. Um, when you're running a full node and you're having to sync from from the start, the you know the performance can really matter. Uh, you know, having an SSD makes a huge difference. But that's only really relevant if you're doing a load of work, and the aim is not to do a load of work anymore. Uh, and the network connection's got to be good enough. So yeah, we're going to see Ethereum on a lot of devices, and they are going to be very very weak um, devices, and they'll be able to cope just fine. Uh, there are multiple threads of work going on to reduce the resource needs. Um, so, you know, we, we, we can cope now, and the demands are going to get a lot lower. So it's only going to get better. Thank you so much, Bob. And there we go. Yeah, that's IoT great. IoT will be a delight with blockchain.